last lecture of the course and um, so the the fourth exam will be next Tuesday um, I won't be around for the rest of the week but any of you who want to talk to me I will be available on Monday afternoon um, today we're going to continue on the idea of how we use visual information to guide our locomotion and um, we're going to talk about um, how we navigate through the environment. Um, so for example, uh, if you were going to give somebody directions on how to get to the library from here, what would you tell them? What's that? Go like left or right or forward or back. Yeah, well, what, how would you tell them? Say a stranger walked in here and say, how do I get to the library? Exit the building, go down the stairs, and then walk turn left, walk up the street, into the main doors of the library. Um, you don't tell them how far to walk? You can see it from here. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't tell them what, to look for, what it looks like? Yeah, it's, it's a big building, the biggest one in front of me. Um, we give directions all the time. We navigate all the time. And so the question we're going to try and worry about today is, what it is that we actually know in our heads uh, when we're moving around the world. It turns out there are lots of theories of how people do that. And um, as with many other aspects of this course, it turns out that humans do this in a, in a wide variety of ways. And if we go look at the animal kingdom, uh, animals do this in an even larger variety of ways. So let's talk about some examples. Um, so one example is um, ants. Uh, these are ants in Australia. And what ants will do is forage for food. And they exhibit a very interesting behavior when they do that. So let's say this is the nest. And you see this circuitous path that the ant is traveling in. Uh, it's smelling and probing, and then it finds some food. And now the amazing thing happens. The ant does a beeline straight back to the nest. So one of the questions is, how does the ant know how to do that? Now, there's an interesting experiment that's been done. So suppose when the ant finds the food, an experimenter then picks up the ant and moves it over here. What the ant will do is won't go to the nest, it'll go down here. So apparently what the ants are doing is they're integrating all the turns that they take as they're walking around exploring from food and they can undo that and walk straight back to the nest. But if you pick them up and move them to a different location, they don't know that they're in a different location. They don't know from that location how to get to the nest. And so if you take the ant and move it over here, it will search for the nest down here, and then it'll start exploring again. So this is an example from ant behavior. We'll see whether humans can do this in a little bit. Not nearly as well as ants, I should say. Um, bees, are able to tell, um, can use the sun as a compass. Now this is tricky because the sun is at different positions in different times of the day and bees can apparently figure that out. And so there have been a number of experiments on this. Um, they look at the pattern of solar movement. It's nonlinear over the day. It varies with season and latitude. Animals learn the current local pattern of solar movement. And it's not just a list of time link solar position, but a function that can be used to find unknown positions of the sun. And so here's an example of how they study that with pigeons. Uh, to get food in the box, birds must choose the correct angle relative to the sun compensated for solar movement. And pigeons are able to do that. Other insects uh, use landmarks to know where they're going to. So let's say here that uh, you have a, um, what is this thing, a wasp? Looks like a wasp. 
um, has a nest that's defined by these pine cones that are uh, set right here. So if the wasp flies away and the researcher goes and moves these pine cones to a different location, um, the wasp will go to the center of the pine cones, not to the nest. So in this case, the evidence is suggesting that um, uh, the wasp are using landmarks to find uh, where it is they're going. Now just to telegraph where we're going to go, um, humans have a primitive set of path integration uh, I'll sh not nearly as good as ants, uh, and we're also heavily reliant on landmarks. Oh, we don't use the sun, but we're heavily reliant on landmarks. Now, one of the main theories of navigation in cognitive psychology, which I find crazy, uh, I'll describe why I think that in a moment, but the idea is that we have a cognitive map so imagine now that you know, you're on a helicopter, you're looking down at the OSU campus, um, and somehow you build up a map about where all the buildings are, uh, where all the streets are, and you have that somehow in your knowledge, uh, the cognitive map, and then you can use the cognitive map uh, in, in order to get around. Now sometimes a cognitive map is reasonable. Anybody here from New York? Okay, where in New York are you from? Brooklyn. Brooklyn. Right, I'm not going to ask you about Brooklyn directly in the center, but if you're in Upper Manhattan, uh, say, is it easy to get around? No. I mean, it's accessible because there's lots of trains and buses, but... No, 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 that's not... I, I, that's perfectly reasonable interpretation of my question, but that's not what I meant. Um, so let's say you're on First Avenue and um, 54th Street, and you want to go up to Fifth Avenue and 125th Street. Um, you can visualize in your head how to do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you're in Brooklyn, not so much, and worse if you're in Lower Manhattan. And what makes Lower Manhattan a problem? It's, it's like the streets are thrown together, like somebody took a pile of spaghetti, threw it on the ground, and that's the organization of the streets in Lower Manhattan. I've not spent much time in Brooklyn, but I imagine it has a structure not unlike that. Boston is the same way. Uh, the streets all curve around in random directions, and to make things even worse, they randomly change the one-way directions of the streets, uh, which they change from time to time just to really screw people up. Um, so the idea of a cognitive map in that kind of environment is, is a little bit far-fetched. But if everything's laid out as a nice grid, um, yeah, it's not so bad. So how would you form a cognitive map? Uh, well, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So here's some strategies we're going to talk about. Cognitive maps, path integration, landmarks or beacons, and root knowledge. And I'll unpack these things as we go. So let's say you're at this location and you want to get over here. Um, so the working hypothesis we're going to take is that apparently Euclidean behavior may result from non-Euclidean spatial knowledge and adaptive navigation strategies. So here's the basic idea of how you might be able to build a Euclidean cognitive map. So let's say this is your home position. You just moved to a new neighborhood and you're trying to learn your way around and you learn how to get from your home to position B. Say position B is the nearest grocery store. And you also learn how to get from home to position A. Let's say A is the nearest gas station. Now here's the test. How would you figure out if you're at A and you want to get to B, how might you do that? So you know how to get from home to A, you know how to get from home to B, but now you're at A and you want to get to B. 
What's the most efficient way to go from there? Straight line from where? From A to B, but you haven't learned A to B yet. Any guesses on this? The one thing you could do is you know A to home, so you could go from A to home and home to B, but that's not very efficient. Uh, so the idea behind a cognitive map is if you have a representation of this vector and that vector and you subtract the two together, that gives you the vector from A to B. All right, so this is a suggestion about how you could learn shortcuts in a space. Once you've learned a few vectors in the space, you can uh, subtract those two vectors and determine the shortcut. Now, once you learn this, you can use it to get other shortcuts. So let's say now you want to go from A to C. All right, so by, by learning these local routes and calculating shortcuts by doing vector subtraction over time, at least that's the hypothesis, you could gradually build up a metric representation of the environment, something like a mental map. But there's a problem of whether we actually have mental maps. Did one of you guys tell me you were from um, Hyderabad? Okay. Um, so this is, uh, this is a slide from my friend Bill Warren, and he had a student from Hyderabad in his class. And the student says he gets around Hyderabad just fine. But if you show him a map, he's completely clueless. Um, so could you find things on this map based on your global knowledge? No. Would you have any trouble getting around Hyderabad if you were there? Only in the village where my mom's from. I don't know the whole city. It's okay. But at least the local neighborhoods. Um, so the same thing in Boston, right? I know how to get around Boston. I lived there for 15 years. Um, but if you showed me a map of Boston, wouldn't be able to do it. Lower Manhattan's the same way. Um, this is suggesting that maybe when you're traveling around near your mom's house in Hyderabad, you're not using a mental map. So let's ask you intuitively, when you're doing that, how do you know if you want to get from A to B, how, what sort of information do you use to get there? I guess I recognize the number of things around me. Okay, that's, that's called landmarks. And then I kind of know how long I've traveled before, so like I should figure it out by based on how long I've been walking somewhere. All right, that's called root knowledge. I'll flesh that out a little bit more as we go along. Uh, but the point I'm trying to raise here is that there are all kinds of strategies one could use to get around. Landmarks are a very important one. Uh, ordinal relations and topology are also really important. So we're coming full circle. Remember when we talked about the Klein hierarchy of geometries? I introduced all that for a reason because it crops into the psychology of perception over and over again. Um, so shortcuts and estimates are highly variable. Path integration is highly variable. Only about 17% of the people can do this at all. So by path integration, right, I teach you how to go from home to A, I teach you how to go from home to B, I put you on A and you're supposed to walk to B. About 17% of the population is able to do that with some degree of accuracy. Uh, almost everybody else shows really large patterns of errors. Um, you get violations of the metric postulates. Um, now I haven't gone into this, but the, um, for example, if you have a metric space, it means that the distance from A to B uh, should be the same as the distance from B to A. That seems pretty intuitive. But if you're asking people to judge a distance, let's say B is at the top of a hill, subjects will judge the distance to, from A to B to be longer than the distance from B to A, which is not crazy, but they're factoring in the effort that's involved in order to get there.
All right, now, one way to study this, this is uh, the same Venn lab that we talked about last time with the um, catching baseball experiment that was done at Brown. Uh, they've also done a large series of experiments on navigation. And um, this is an uh, example of the, the lab. So they have motion sensors in the ceiling. This is what the HMD looks like. This is what the simulated environment looks like. And uh, so the first experiment they did, this is from Warren Deshawn and Tar, or through Warren Deshawn and Tar, uh, is they asked to see, can humans do path integration? So it's exactly the task I told you before. You learn home to A, you learn home to B, and then you put subjects at A and you tell them walk to B. So they learn home to A, they learn home to B. You now place them either at A or at B and ask them to walk to the other one. Um, so you train them on that, you train them on that, and then see if they can do a novel shortcut. And this is what they do. All right, so here they're trying to go from B to A and you notice they're, they're way off. And here they're trying to go from A to B, and they're even farther off. So they're showing really large errors. They're not showing any evidence that uh, they can do vector subtraction uh, to calculate the correct orientation of the shortcut. Uh, so they do both underturns and undershoots. Um, so notice they're walking. They, the angle's wrong and the distance is wrong. Now, if you have landmarks, it's another story. So initially, they start to be off, but then if they see a tree, this is exactly as you pointed out earlier, right? So if there's a landmark that they know that A is near a particular kind of tree, right? They walk along, they see the tree, and oh, I'll walk to that. And so you get this kind of behavior uh, when landmarks are present. So what this shows is that subjects are not particularly good at doing path integration, uh, but if you give them landmarks, they'll use them. So here's another example. If you, this is similar to the experiment I told you before with wasps. Uh, if they learn to use a landmark to get to a particular location, and then you move the landmark, uh, the subjects will make characteristic errors. So again, provides pretty hard evidence that they really do use landmarks. I remember when I was a little kid, um, I grew up in my middle school years in Cincinnati. Any of you from Cincinnati? So I, I lived in Finneytown. And uh, the house we lived in was uh, a pink ranch house. And apparently everybody in the neighborhood used our house as a landmark um, to guide people to go to the place. They'd say, well, all right, you know, go to the pink house, do another block and turn right. And somewhere along the line, my dad decided he couldn't stand the idea of living in a pink house, so he painted it barn red or something like that. And uh, lots of the neighbors started to complain because their navigation instructions weren't working. In fact, I remember one time, I think I was in the fifth grade, and um, the teacher was describing how you get to somewhere. And she says, um, well, you go a mile past the pink house, and all little kids in the class said, it's not pink anymore, Miss Harrison. Um, but that's a, that's a great example of, of using landmarks. I have another story about this. When I lived in um, uh, Boston, and we lived out in a town called uh, Bedford, which is right between Lexington and Concord, and there's nothing out there. there. There are no real landmarks. And so when I wrote up directions to the house, I would say, you know, drive to exit 17, um, take a left, go 1.5 miles, 
take a right, go two miles, take a left, and our house will be on the right. And half the people we'd have parties would get lost. The whole idea of giving direction like that was an abomination. They'd say, give us some landmarks. And my response was, there aren't any landmarks. Every house looks like every other house out there. Um, uh, there's a big gender difference on this. It was mostly the women who were complaining bitterly. The men would go, great directions. Um, but uh, I have no explanation for why that might be the case. So conclusion, landmarks dominate shortcuts when available, but approximate shortcuts are possible without landmarks. Uh, evidence for two navigation strategies, guidance by landmarks, beacons is dominant, but you can fall back to path integration if you don't have it. You're just not going to be as accurate in that case. Any questions about this before I move on? All right, so now the question we want to ask is what's the geometric structure of a cognitive map? Is it Euclidean? Is it something else? Is it globally consistent? Is it fragmented? Is it hierarchical? All sorts of questions to ask about what the nature of our knowledge about the environment we live in is. Now, there's a hint to this. Um, anybody recognize this map? How many of you have been to Washington, D.C. before and taken the subway system? You've seen this map? Um, is this an accurate map? You're shaking your head. Why do you say it's not accurate? Uh, there's no way everything lines up that way, like in a straight line like that. So what makes it work? Uh, it's sequential. It's right, so you get on the train, and uh, you know each exit has a number. So you get on and you're told you need to get off exit 8. Well, I guess they don't have a number. You need to get off whatever the name of the street they put on the exit is. And so you sit in the train until the announcement come on, next stop, South Street. And you see everybody get off and they get the train. So in that model, right, this thing could be spinning around like crazy. You don't care. In practice, it probably is straight because it's more efficient to run the train that way. But it doesn't matter as far as the knowledge that you're getting from, uh, from this kind of map. So what you're really using is ordinal and topological information. So the idea is that you're on this line. You don't really care whether the line's straight, whether the line's curved, um, whether the line goes up, whether the line goes down. What you care about is the order of stops on the line. Now, this kind of map is quite old. It goes back to London uh, in the turn of the century. People were making maps this way. Um, so they're, they're preserving the topology, and they're preserving the ordinal relations among the stops, uh, but they're violating pretty much everything else. So this kind of map is definitely not uh, Euclidean. So let's review what a Euclidean map would mean. So Euclidean, you would have knowledge of local distances and angles. Everything would be globally consistent. Um, and Euclidean stuff is very unstable. So to the extent that we have Euclidean knowledge, it's really brittle. Ordinal is 1D sequences of places and junctions, right? So if I'm giving you directions, I say, go three blocks north and take a right. Now, all of you would give directions to that. What, what are you doing? I say three blocks north, so I've got a, a, a direction there. Um, go three blocks. I didn't say anything about how long those blocks are. So you look for three intersections and then you take a left. All right, we all give and use directions of that form. Uh, there's no distance information in there, so it's obviously not Euclidean. It's using ordinal and topological information. 
Um, so topological information involves graph, connectivity, neighborhoods, adjacency, occlusions. This is the most stable and the most robust. So the idea here is if you buy the Kleinian story that I've been building throughout the class, the, um, this should be the most powerful representation, the most stable representation of the environment. Uh, ordinal should be next, and Euclidean should be the worst. So let's see how subjects do on this and some really clever experiments by uh, Bill Warren. So the basic idea is, do people learn sequences of places? So let's say I'm home, and you want to go to position D, and you know you have to pass the turnoff to A, you have to pass B, you have to pass the turnoff to C, and you have to then take a right at D. So let's see if any of you can really nail this down. Consider two hypotheses. One is that you've got a Euclidean representation of this space. So I know all these distances and I know all these angles. And the other hypothesis is all I know is the ordinal relationship. I know that, a com that B comes after A, C comes after B, and D comes after C. So how might you test whether observers are using ordinal knowledge or metric knowledge. Any guesses about this? Yeah. So you stretch the space? Remember, this experiment's done in VR, so you can actually do that. All right, so now we'll teach subjects to learn a path where they could learn the distances or they could learn the orders of things. And then we'll do exactly as you suggested. We'll now change the underlying model in virtual reality to distort the distances and see if it has any effect on the subject's behavior. So here's what they have to do. Um, they have to learn locations of 11 named places. Uh, what do we have, five? I don't see 11 on here, but it doesn't matter. So subjects are in v VR, so they're walking through a hedge maze in virtual reality. And um, so this is the home position, and they're told, uh, I want you to find a target um, at this position right here. All right, now if you're using ordinal information, how would you do this? Uh, you might know, or you might learn that it's the third um, uh, opening on the right. I take the, the third opening on the right and follow that to the end, and you'll find the target. And what would you do if you're using metric information? Um, maybe three steps or feet or whatever forward, uh, you know, maybe ten. To the ten forward. steps forward and then take a right. All right. Now, let's suppose now that I stretch this space. Target's in the same place. Um, but I stretch it just enough so that um, what was here in terms of distance is now this one. So if they're using metric knowledge, they go to the second one and look for the target there. If they're using the ordinal information, they'd say, take the first, second, third right and find the target there. And what do you think subjects do? Take the third one. Um, they almost always go here. Uh, in this particular case, no subject uh, exhibited the uh, metric behavior. In this case, um, I think one subject did, and then you had some idiot here got lost. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you've ever been lost in a hedge maze before. You can, uh, uh, you start exhibiting uh, random behavior. Uh, so overwhelming evidence that what they're using is the ordinal relations rather than the metric relations.
Here's another example. Um, so you stretch the space. Almost everybody goes, the ordinal prediction is one subject went to the metric one. So the conclusion, people rely on ordinal sequence of junctions rather than metric distances and angles, uh, consistent with reliance on ordinal rather than Euclidean knowledge for navigation. Um, and this is consistent with the map that I gave when I lived in Boston. If, I, if you specifically lay out, go 1.5 miles, take a right, people don't want to hear that. They say, take the third right or take the right next to the bank house. Um, they don't want to hear, go two miles and then turn 60 degrees. They, they want landmarks, they want ordinal relations. Ah, however, they do have some rough knowledge of distances and angles. It's not like we don't know that at all. It's just crude, it's coarse, it's not nearly reliable as the order relations are. Now this is one of my favorite experiments of all time. Um, so what they were interested in doing was um, really getting at the notion of topological relations. Um, the idea that, so here, here's the idea of the experiment. What they did is they, uh, subjects are walking around in VR and um, they have a maze and in the maze, there are wormholes. Uh, some of you played Portal before. Um, so you all know what a wormhole is? So a wormhole is a structure in space where if you go through the wormhole, you instantly go from one galaxy to another galaxy. Uh, there was a, um, uh, what the hell was that? sci-fi show that was on for years, probably none of you remember it, uh, Voyager, uh, where they went through a wormhole, couldn't find the wormhole again, and now they have to travel through a whole galaxy to get back home, uh, which took three seasons of a, or six or seven seasons of a television series conveniently to do it. Um, so the question, there are a couple questions here. A, if you have a maze that has a wormhole in it, Will observers use it? And B, and this is the, the key, will they notice that there's anything weird about the space? So here's the idea. The, um, you have a wormhole here, which instantly transports you. So you walk toward the wormhole, the target location, and then it automatically transports you from over here. So let's say there's another wormhole that goes between these two locations. So one wormhole connects those, another wormhole connects those. And so the subject is positioned somewhere in this space. They're told to get to a different position. And the question is, will they actually use the wormholes? And it turns out the answer is yes, they will use the wormholes. And I think I have some data here. Yeah, so if the subjects are trying to get over here, uh, they'll all go to the wormhole. Uh, I'm sorry, they'll all go, if they're starting at position B, um, the always go to this position where they pass through the wormhole and then out. Without the wormhole, they exhibit very different behavior. All right, so the moral of the story is, if there's a wormhole in the space, the subjects will use it. Now, here's the key question. Will they notice that there's something weird? All right, so suppose you walk out this door and you end up in the library. Now, it might be the case that you don't know, right, if you, if you weren't so over familiar with campus, that might not seem so strange. You walk through the door, you're in the library. Um, that's normal state of affairs. Until you go outside the library and you try to get back to this building and you realize it's 
it's much more complicated than just walking through that door. Um, so if you ask subjects to draw um, what they see, they'll willingly draw sketch maps even though they're impossible to represent the wormholes in these 2D sketches. And if you ask them, did you notice anything weird about the maze, they'll tell you, no, look perfectly sensible. I was just walking to the shortest path between two points. All right, this provides really strong information that what subjects are using is topological information. In particular, they're using um, what would be known in mathematics as a graph. Right, so what a graph does is you have a bunch of nodes and you have a bunch of connections between the nodes and all that matters is the pattern of connectivity. Uh, the distances don't matter, it's just the, it's just the pattern of connectivity. And what this is suggesting is that uh, when subjects are using these wormholes, they've got, they're representing the space as a kind of graph. And they can navigate through that graph. And because that's something they do anyway, uh, they don't notice it's particularly weird if you walk through the door and you step out in the library, uh, if they're first learning the space. So, moral of the story, there's no consistent cognitive map. Uh, we can tolerate radical inconsistencies. It's closer to a cognitive graph. Uh, so our knowledge captures the ordinal relations, the place, the neighborhoods, uh, local metric knowledge, but not global metric knowledge. And we have multiple strategies for getting through pay. So if you force subjects to do it, if you take out all the landmarks, uh, you take out all the set paths, uh, you don't allow them to do anything but path integration, uh, they'll try to do path integration. They won't be particularly accurate at it, but they're not completely a chance either. Uh, they primarily rely on topological spatial knowledge uh, and can fall back on rough metric knowledge. Uh, so apparently Euclidean behavior can result from adaptive strategies that exploit non-Euclidean spatial knowledge. Any questions about this before I move on? All right, I, I, let me just say a little bit about these experiments because I think they're really um, elegant. All right, so what he does is he, he's isolating, if I was using metric knowledge, if I distort the maze, I'll get this behavior. Um, and then you, this is the kind of thing you could only do in VR. You couldn't do this in a real environment. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful tool for that. Similarly, wormholes, you couldn't do, a, you, you can't create a room where you walk through one door and you end up in the library. Um, I sure wish this semester that was a door I could walk through here and get to my other classroom on the other side of campus. But no, there is no such doorway. Um, but if there were, we could use it and we wouldn't find it necessarily particularly strange. All right, now I want to cover one last topic before I uh, let you go. I'll probably let you out a little bit early today. Um, and that is there, there are a couple of anomalous findings in the literature, again, which suggest um, uh, that there are differences in different kind of knowledge about space based on the Klein hierarchy. So do you remember me talking about this uh, patient DF earlier in the course? Uh, so DF has um, uh, visual agnosia, profound visual agnosia, and um, if you ask her to, uh, so if you show her a vertical line and uh, you ask her to draw it, this is what she'll draw if you do, say, ask her to do that 20 times in a row. You, you'll get random orientations of what she draws. This is what a normal subject does. All right, so she, she can't get the orientation of that line, or so it would seem uh, from this particular behavior. 
Now, if you change the experiment a bit, and you give her an apparatus like this, right? So it's a, a, a slot that you can turn to different orientations. And you give her a, um, a rectangular thing that just fits through the slot. And you say, put the rectangular thing through the slot. She does that almost perfectly. Now, in order to do that, she's got to know the local orientation. So how is it that DF can do this just fine. This is the data here. This is DF's behavior, and this is the control condition. But if you ask her to draw it, she's, she's clueless. We're going to want to try and understand that. And just to telegraph, the answer is going to come down to this Kleinian, Kleinian ideas. Here's another famous experiment. Let's do an experiment. Um, Samir, let me pick on you. Come on up in front of the class. Here, help me move this thing. This way. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to beat you with a stick, I promise. Go over to the end there. All right? Now, what I want you to do is to look at the location of the stick here. All right? I'll do it here so you have maximum space to work. I want you to close your eyes and walk forward and touch the end of the stick. Pretty close. Let's do it one more time. I pulled it away. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll leave it next time. Go back. Let's do it again. All right. This time, do it more. Do it with more confidence. All right. Don't feel around. Just commit yourself and point to where you think it is. All right. Is that impressive or what? Thank you. So this is an experiment, um, I don't know who did this first, uh, there's a, um, I think it was an Irish guy, a guy named Jimmy Thompson did this first, but the guy who popularized it uh, is Jack Loomis at UC Santa Barbara. And um, here's the data from that, uh, which confirms what you saw. By the way, if any of you grew up to be professors and lecturers, uh, one of the garden uh, the rules you have to obey. Don't ever do a demonstration if you're not really confident it's going to work. Um, so I would not have done that if I, if I didn't know that um, people are as accurate as they are. That, that, you were spectacular in the second one where I said commit yourself. That way you were right on. Um, here's what you get if you subjects walk to a target uh, and the way they did it, they would put a mark on the ground and subjects had to walk to the marker. Uh, and if you look at um, the distance they walked and the physical distance of the marker, these are what the data look like. Almost a perfect correlation with a slope of one. I mean, the subjects are really good at this. But now here's the problem. Let's change the experiment a little bit. And so instead of walking to a target on the ground, what we do is we'll have two lines. We have one that's arranged like this and one that's arranged like that on the ground. And what the subjects have to do is judge what's the ratio of those two links. So is the horizontal one longer, shorter than the one that's oriented in depth, and how much longer or shorter is it? And um, if you do that, what you find is subjects make huge errors. Um, so this is the physical distance in meters. Um, this is the match depth to width ratio. So if the depth to width ratio is um, two, I'm missing something on this graph. Moral of the story is, I'll, I'll just cut to the chase. Subjects are really bad at this task. 
And what they do is they, over, they underestimate the length of the one oriented in depth. We've talked about that before um, relative to the one that's horizontally. So the question is, and I'll toss it to the class to see if any of you have any ideas about this. How are those two results possible? How is it possible that you can walk accurately to the target, which suggests I know what the distance is, um, but I can't judge the distance in this direction to a distance in that direction? Yeah? Well, because one is using your visual cues versus the other one you're like actually just walking the distance. You're making sense, and that's one of the hypotheses. So one of the hypotheses is that perceptually, uh, things are distorted like hell. But motorically, at some subconscious level, your motor system has the correct layout of things. So that's one of the hypotheses. Um, in fact, that's probably the most common hypothesis. Um, I don't buy it myself. If, um, if your motor system had this accurate knowledge of metric structure, why wouldn't it allow your perception to have access to it? It doesn't make much sense. Yeah? Well, I mean, I was going to add to that the reason you can like, judge something then is like so, the length of it that's horizontal would be because you don't typically walk horizontally like a crab. So, like, it makes sense. Ah, that's a good point. However, 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 it's the one in depth that you're misjudging. The horizontal one you're fairly accurate at. Well, because you don't have to visually know the depth one because you move physically in depth. I don't know, like, do you see All right, you that's a reasonable hypothesis. It's a common hypothesis. Um, is that your motor system knows more that your, than your perceptual system does. Right? And a lot of that's internalized. So, for example, you know, when, you're, when you're a professional basketball player, um, you, know, you get that motor memory, you learn how to take those shots, you're not thinking about it, you just take it. Um, that's one theory. Uh, I remember I was giving a talk on this stuff a number of years ago at uh, um, University of Indiana, and uh, one of the big time people there, a member of the National Academy, he says, well, if, if your knowledge of metric structure is so bad, how's Michael Jack, or Michael, why do I call Michael Jordan <laughs> Michael Jack? That's, that's not the first time I've done that in this course. Um, how is Michael Jordan able to, to hit a basketball shot? And my response was, well, I don't know, but he sure as hell can't hit a curve. <laughs> Um, so if you don't know, Michael Jordan quit baseball or quit basketball to have a pro baseball career that didn't end particularly well. Um, but this is something that is has been perplexing people for a long time. Now I have a slightly different take on it, um, and um, so this is work done by. Um, one of my students, a German woman named Laura Thaler, uh, who unfortunately when she wrote this stuff up, her take was different than mine, so she didn't write up my hypothesis, she wrote up her own, which is fine, it was her paper, it's her thesis. Um, but my idea was the following, and that is when you're walking to the target on the ground, you've got this notion you're walking to a specific target and so one way you could potentially do this is um, all right I want everybody to close their eyes and I want you to hold your finger one inch in front of your nose not a problem is it all right, now do it two inches in front of your nose, a foot in front of your nose. All right, you can do that also. So what does this tell us? What this tells us is, is that we have a map, a haptic map of where things are in space 
and how to get to them. All right, so there are a couple ways to do that, right? I could take my finger, if my eyes are open, estimate the distance between the finger and the nose, and stop where it's one foot. Or, but I, that doesn't work if your eyes are closed. If your eyes are closed, you can exploit the fact that um, I have this map of where my limbs are at any given moment in time, and all I have to do is align that with things in visual space. So let's suppose now that what I have is a topological map of all the positions in space. And I also have a haptic motor map that says uh, this movement corresponds to that position in space. All right, so if I want to touch the edge of your computer, right, it occupies, so I see it at a position in visual space, but I also know in my haptic space, it's well, off a little bit, but you, you get the idea. What you have to do is keep those maps aligned. Now the alternative is, you could say, well, I'm going to judge how far away this is from my current finger, and then I'm going to program my limbs to move precisely that distance. So in one case, I'm just moving my limb to a point in space. It doesn't involve any calculations of distance, because I've got these corresponding maps. And the other case, I'm actually programming the distance that I'm going to move. So how do we test that? Well, what Laura did is she built a, uh, a desktop virtual reality setup. This is really cool if you could see it in person. So what she has is a projection video up here. Um, this is a rear projector screen. Uh, this is a mirror, and this is a tabletop with a digitizing tablet on it. So what this looks like is when subjects look at an image in the mirror, they think it's a point on the tabletop. Okay, so the way that works, the image is actually here. It's being reflected on the mirror, but then it looks like it's down there. And it's totally believable. So you think, I'm looking at an object on the table. I mean, the, there's, it, it, it really is effective. Um, and now we did two tasks. So task one, uh, we showed subjects a target. So subjects start at a home position. They see a target, and they have to reach to it. Second task, um, so I'm just sort of home position. They see two targets, and notice the two targets define a distance and a direction. And so what subjects have to do is to move their hand this distance and this direction. So the subject would be expected to do something like that. So the required movement is exactly the same in both conditions. But the way they program the motion is different. So in one case, they're reaching to a visible point. In the other, they're not. They're getting instruction that says, you know, move two feet at an angle of 10 degrees. Turns out, if you look at the variance, Subjects find this task just trivially simple. Oh, by the way, I, I should say they can't see their hand. All right, so they're making the movement, but they can't see their hand. They can only see the target. Uh, subjects say this is really easy, and if you look at the errors they make, they're amazingly accurate. Over here, the errors are about 10 times larger. The subjects complain that the task is ridiculous. They don't like doing it, um, which is telling us maybe there is something special about reaching to a target 
as opposed to reaching a designated distance and angle from the home position. Now the other thing we did is we, uh, we adapt, we, we would give them incorrect feedback. And what we found is if you give incorrect feedback on this task, it doesn't transfer to here. And if you give incorrect feedback on this one, it doesn't transfer to there. Um, that's a pretty strong evidence that we're talking about two different modes of reaching behavior. All right, now what this suggests is that um, if we're aligning our motor maps with our visual maps, um, that leads to problems. Because what happens, for example, if I take off my glasses? My vision might get screwed up and um, it might alter my behavior. You have to constantly adapt. So the idea is that because you're always getting visual feedback when you move through space, right? So if I try to toss you a ball and it lands too short, uh, next time I toss it, I'll put a little more force in it and gradually I'll adapt so I get the right distance. Um, so the idea is we're constantly adapting uh, to change visual inputs and getting our motor stuff aligned. Um, all right, who wants to volunteer to be another demo? I see everybody looking away from me. Come on up. Oh. Do you know what's coming? Is it, is it a prism? I saw it up there. Yeah, it's a prism. Okay. Can I put it on with my glasses? Yeah. Okay. All right, just to give the class a sense of what's this like. Oh, God. Uh, I'm not gonna hit you with it. <laughs> Tell me, does it look straight or curved? Curved. All right, I want you to feel it. Rub your hand up and down. Does it feel straight or curved? Feels curved. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Uh, well, it might be curved. I curved it while you were putting on the glasses. All right, take off the glasses for a second. I, I need to practice you on the task first. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. Um, just to show how accurate you are reaching. Mm -hmm. I want you to... Um, locate the end of the stick, okay. close your eyes, mm -hmm. and point to it. He's pretty good. All right? I'll put it over here. Close your eyes, point to it. Okay? Open your eyes. Okay. Close your eyes, point to it. Very good. Now it's time for the glasses. All right, look at the end of the stick, okay. close your eyes, point to it. <laughs> okay. All right, you're gonna learn to do this. It doesn't take very okay. long. All right, over here, look at the end of the stick, close your eyes, Wait, I'll close my eyes. and point to it. Okay, wait, I gotta do it again. Okay. All right, let's do it over here. Right. Close your eyes, point to it. Okay, we'll do it again. Close your eyes, point to it. You're getting better. Close your eyes, point to it. Close your eyes, point to it. All right, take the, uh, keep your eyes open now. Um, point to the end of the stick. Do it ballistically. So, point to the end of the stick. Okay, yeah, it's, it like, goes right there. Point to the end of the stick. Point to the end of the stick. <laughs> Point to the end of the stick. Ah, right. Okay, got it. Point to the end of the stick. Excellent. Point to the end of the stick. Excellent. Point to the end of the stick. Are you wow. lying? <laughs> She's adapted. Oh. <laughs> okay, now here's the, here's the key to the test. Take off the glasses. Mm -hmm. Check where it is, okay. close your eyes, point to the end of the stick. Did she get it? No, she's off. 
It was like this much. No. Yeah. <laughs> Enough for government work. <laughs> I violated my role. This almost always works. Do it one more time. Oh, just without them. Okay. Close your eyes. Point the end of the stick. Is it supposed to be wrong? Yeah, she's right? off there. It's supposed to be wrong. Yeah. Because I've adjusted it. And in the opposite direction. That's so cool. All right, sit down. Give her a round of applause. So this is an example of how rapidly we can adapt. You see, it took her, what, 10 trials when she got feedback to alter her motor behavior to uh, be able to point accurately, even though she was wearing these uh, uh, distorted. How would you describe how the world looked through those things? Yeah, there's some famous experiments around these things. There's a guy named Stratton who wore a whole bunch of uh, crazy lenses. There's one where it turns the world upside down. I tried that once. I kept the glasses on for about 30 seconds. <laughs> Any ideas why I had to take them off? <laughs> uh, they made me hugely motion sick. Um, so just to show you the data here, So this is the wedge. What they do is they shift the world in one direction, depending on how the wedge is uh, oriented. And um, here's what the data look like. So pre-test, if you looked at subjects pointing accuracy, they're right on the money. Then when they put on the glasses, they're off in one direction, as you see here. But then they quickly, over not very many trials, uh, their pointing gets quite accurate. And then when they take off the glasses, they err in the other direction, but then after just a few trials, uh, they adapt. Uh, so this provides pretty strong support of this idea that uh, a lot of our motor behavior is not based on calculating distances and angles, but it's keeping the map of my haptic motor space aligned with the map of my visual space. So it's using a much cruder geometry than what we would expect from uh, Euclidean geometry. Well, that's it for the course, guys. Um, I think that's the last slide, it is. You've, you've really been a great class and I appreciate having you. And uh, have a good Thanksgiving and I'll see you on Tuesday for the last exam. By the way, um, I, will, I will not be available to meet with you uh, the rest of the week, but I am available on Monday afternoon if any of you want to schedule an appointment with me then. So have a good Thanksgiving. <laughs>